told Dale I really appreciate the fact that as this was being planned, they gave ample time for the gospel to be presented today because, because of the reasons that I'm going to share with you. Um, but I appreciate the fact that we're going to have several different opportunities and different perspectives uh, coming our way about the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we don't have to rush and hurry. Uh, I told Pete if we overlap some places, or Richard, or Deborah, or Dale, that's okay. I don't usually get things on the first time around anyway. <laughs> so the main point is that the gospel is good news. And as I was talking to the Lord about this morning, from really from the first time that Dale asked us to do this, and was pondering the things that he might want done today, three things came to me. So I'm going to give you those first because I have a way of not uh, getting around to everything sometimes, and I want to I respect the schedule. So these are the three things that I believe the Lord gave me when Dale said reasons for why we would share the gospel or scriptural basis for spreading the gospel. And he also added on there, in agreement with the will of God. So that's my um, privilege this morning. I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, and, and especially thank the church for the opportunity uh, to share with you this morning. So, why would we share the gospel? Three reasons that I know of that are scriptural. I'm not saying there aren't more, but these are the three that I have in my heart this morning. The first one is that Jesus commands us to share the gospel. That's what he said to do. And we're going to go back and look at the scriptures uh, that substantiate that, uh, but it wasn't just a suggestion, it was a command. The understood uh, subject of that sentence, go, is you, you go. So we'll look at this together. And then the second thing that came to me is that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, that's Romans 1.16. If we don't preach the gospel, and we're not proclaiming the message that has the power in it for people to be born again and saved as they continue in it. So we must proclaim the gospel. That's the atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to work in so that people can hear the truth and receive the Lord, receive the Savior, Jesus. And we'll talk about that some more. And then the third reason is that the gospel is good news. And it's good news to all people, not just some people. It's all inclusive. And there are many people who haven't been included because they haven't heard. They may have heard a religious presentation, but they haven't heard the truth. The fact that God loves you. The fact that God is for you. The fact that God loved us so much that he was willing to come himself and offer himself through a human body named Jesus in order to pay a penalty that he knew we could never pay. And the fact that we could never pay it means that we were eternally judged. The good news is, no, we're not. Because someone has come to take our place. God himself came to take our place. That's good news. Because we could never have worked it out or earned it in any way. But we don't have to. So it isn't based on our performance. The good news is, that our salvation is based on Jesus' performance, and He performed perfectly. He's God's only begotten Son, and the Father said, I'm well pleased with Him. Now, if we're in Jesus, then that's how God sees us. And if you haven't had a real revelation of that, I'm going to give you a reading assignment, because uh, I'm used to doing that. Read John 17. Read the prayer Jesus prayed. And, and you can know, this is written in red, if anybody ever got his prayers answered and prayed according to the will of God, it was Jesus. We are included in that prayer. Let me just show you the verse. I didn't have this uh, on my agenda, but I want to show it to you because I usually go back to this. A lot of people have never seen this or realized. Look in John 17 for just a moment. And I want you to read the whole prayer because it's rich. But I want to call your attention to verse um, 23. Because, well, look at 20 first and then 23. 
Jesus is praying, and he's praying for those who are right with him. And this is a very uh, sincere time for him. Not that all his times weren't sincere, but he's coming, you know, he's coming toward the time when he's going to be uh, leaving them physically. And he says this in verse 20, I don't pray for these alone. Do you see that? So Jesus is saying, Father, I'm not just praying for these who are right here with me, not just these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, how many generations does that cover? As many as there will ever be. How did we believe? We believe through the word that's recorded for us through these uh, first believers, okay, these apostles of Jesus. So Jesus is praying for us too, for those who will believe in me through the word, through the lifestyles, through the, the uh, sacrifices, through the teaching, through the demonstration, and through the written word and spoken word that these men would leave for us, for all generations. This is for us. And then if you look down in verse 23, Jesus said, I want them to be one just the same way we're one. That's verse 22. And then he says, let, let them, I'm sorry, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you've sent me. So part of our being one with Jesus is so that everybody else can understand that he's real, that God sent him, that he's alive, because he's alive in us. And that they have loved, that you have loved them as you have loved me. Now that's a part that a lot of people have a hard time believing, but I'm reading it. It's in red right here. If Jesus hadn't meant it, he wouldn't have prayed it. And if he prayed it, I know God heard him because he always prayed according to God's will. And so, God loves you in Jesus the same way he loves Jesus. He sees us in Jesus. That's good news. And that's the gospel that we carry. God loves you. He loves you just as much as he loves his only begotten son. Because you are in his only begotten son if you're truly born again and have declared Jesus Lord and Savior of, our, of your life. Now here's the deal. We know this. We know this. And, and it is well with us if we're born again. We have an eternal promise in Jesus that we will always be with him and in the presence of the Father. He said, I go to prepare a place for you and I'm coming back for you. We'll be with Jesus, but what about everybody else? You see, we have a responsibility to bring Jesus to other people. And we don't pick and choose because Jesus is for all people. So it's wonderful that it's well with us but what do we say? To hell with everybody else? Or do we go take this treasure, this eternal treasure we have inside of us, Jesus Christ, do we take the treasure that's in this earthen vessel and give him just as hard and as urgently as we can give him, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, every opportunity that we have? That, to me, is what's so important about today. Because we have a responsibility. It's not just fire insurance and I get to go to heaven one day. It's what about my life here? What difference does it make that God has left me in earth? It's supposed to make a big difference for other people. We're not here for ourselves. We're here for Him. So let's look at some scriptures and <coughs> substantiate these three things that Jesus commands us to preach the gospel or proclaim the gospel, his story, that the gospel is the power of God into salvation, and that the gospel is good news. Okay, so we begin, there are three places specifically that came to mind in the scriptures, and I'm going to give you all scripture references uh, that, that I'll be using, and then some of them you may want to just begin to look out for yourself. I would, I would appreciate it if you'd do that because I won't uh, elaborate, all right? I'm going to proclaim more than teach today. But in Matthew 28, we call this the, the Great Commission, or it's commonly known as the Great Commission. Let's look at that together. 
And specifically, since the pastor mentioned disciples, let's look at what Jesus did. Now, here, here's the setting for this. Let me just give you a, a little bit of background. You probably have just in the last week or two uh, read through these scriptures yourself because we typically do at what's called Easter time. Um, this, is, this is where Jesus has been crucified, buried, has resurrected from the dead, and is now in earth again. And Acts tells us, Acts chapter 1, that there are 40 days that he stayed in the earth as a witness himself personally of his own resurrection, and he appeared to many during that time. And we know some of them are named here specifically, and that's not what I'm teaching today. But my point is he had 40 days to be with his men and others and to convince them, because you know they had a hard time believing, even when Mary came and said, I've seen the Lord. He's risen. He's alive. Some of them could hardly believe it. And even when he was with them at the very end, which is where we're going to be reading right now, there were still some who were having a hard time believing it. But we can't be too hard on them. Because sometimes we have a hard time believing too. But we press on to know the Lord. And in our relationship with Him, He wants us to know Him. So that we can believe. He wants us to be believers. Alright? So let's see what He says to these believers. And I'm going to start in verse 18 of Matthew 28. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, Now, you remember when it's in red, you can take it to the bank. Okay? You don't have to question. Jesus never said anything he didn't mean. And he meant what he said. And if he said it, even if it's a hard thing to understand, he meant it. And we need to get the revelation on it. So he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So how much does that leave? For anybody else. If Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, who has any more of it? There's none left for anybody else. Now we do have an adversary, the devil. He's without authority, but he does have power. Jesus tells us in several places, but particularly one that comes to mind is, um, I just forgot the reference. 10.19. Is it Luke 10.19? He tells us that we've been given authority over all the power or ability of the enemy. Luke 10.19. And in John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you have life and that you have it more abundantly. So there is an enemy. But Jesus says right here, he has all authority. So rest now, good news for you as a believer is that even though the enemy has his ways, he has ability, he has supernatural ability, we have authority in Jesus' name over anything that the enemy is trying to do to us or to anybody else if we can believe that and operate in it by the Spirit. That's good news. So Jesus says, all authority is mine, go. Go. And again, what's the understood subject of that sentence? You go. He's talking to them, but we also know he's talking to us. I'll show you that in just a minute. Go and make disciples of all nations. A disciple is one who's taught. Proclaiming the gospel brings people to Jesus so that they can be born again, but that's just entering the kingdom of God. Explaining the gospel or teaching the truth grows people up, disciples people, helps them mature in the kingdom principles of God. Does that make sense? We're born again, but that's not the end of things. That's just the beginning. All right? So he said, disciple all nations, baptizing or immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and that's a teaching in itself, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Ever feel like you're just doing it all by yourself? 
Well, the truth is, you're never all by yourself. If you are in Jesus, you're never going to be alone again. And that's good news. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. All right, now let's look at this same commission in Mark. Because this is where Jesus says specifically, go preach the gospel. So that's my first point. Why should we spread the gospel? And how does that align with the will of God? Jesus said to do it. That's why. And he said to them, I'm in verse uh, four, 15, I'm sorry, Mark 16, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world. Who go? You go. We go. I go. That's what Jesus commanded that we do. And preach the gospel. You see that? All right, that's what Jesus said to do. Preach the good news. There's a lot of preaching going on. But a whole bunch of it isn't good news. Jesus said, go preach the good news. And we're going to look at what that is before my time is up, okay? We need to know who the good news is. And we need to know what he said about himself. How can we represent and minister for Jesus and not know Jesus? We can't. So who is the good news? The good news is a person. It's not just a message. Now we proclaim his message, but the good news is Jesus. The good news is we have a substitute who has totally taken care of every need we'll ever have, spirit, soul, and body. We're covered in Jesus. And we're partakers of the divine nature of God through knowledge of Jesus. We must have a relationship with Jesus before we have anything to give anybody else in the way of the gospel. You can't give what you don't have. So we must be born again. And then once we are, then we have the treasure to give others. Okay? So Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature or every creation or every person. So who's left out? Nobody's left out anymore. You know, for the Gentiles of Jesus' day, this was good news because they were a people who were alienated from God with no covenant. Only the Jews, only the children of Israel had the covenant with God. But Jesus came bringing the message, nobody's left out anymore. So it doesn't matter who we are, where we came from, what our background is, what our past is, whose family we were or weren't born into, what we have or don't have, what the color of our skin is or isn't. Whether we're male or female doesn't make any difference anymore. But we are one or the other. Jesus came for everybody. And that didn't leave out anybody. That's good news. And he said, he who believes, I'm in verse 16, and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Not because I've come to condemn them, because Jesus is going to make it clear that he didn't come, come to condemn anybody. We'll look at that in a minute too. we got a lot to look at, don't we? We will. But we're condemned or sentenced or judged by default. Because the one who has cleared us and exonerated us of all charges, if we don't believe him and receive him, there's not another rescuer. There's not another savior. There's not another one who qualifies to substitute for the sin that we were guilty of. So it's condemnation by your own choice. Because Jesus made it very clear he came to save the lost. He came to save everybody. But we have to believe that. And for those of us who do, he tells us what that means in verse 17. These signs will follow those who believe. So this is how I can tell if I believe or not. These signs will follow. And he goes on to say, in my name, and that's the name that is above every name, God's given Jesus the name above every name. Every disease, every sickness, every malfunction, every dysfunction, every disorder, anything that can be wrong, the good news is 
Jesus is Lord above all of that. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. Not that God doesn't care. It's just that there's not anything He can't take care of and hasn't taken care of in Jesus. He's our deliverer. He's our rescuer. He's our safety. He's our provider. He's our everything. That's good news. And that's what people need to hear. These signs will follow those who believe that. In my name, or in my authority, in my place, we have power of attorney in that name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new languages that men haven't taught them. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And that's, this is all a teaching in itself. And I'm telling you, any serpent or scorpion or evil thing, Satan is called a serpent. Anything from the dark side, from the evil of the enemy, you have authority over that. None of those things are supposed to hurt us if we're believers. And we don't need to be afraid of them. You know, the word cancer strikes fear in groups of people all over, especially the United States. I'm told that there's some countries that don't even have it around. But cancer is just a word. It's not a God. And anything evil, we have authority over that, if we can believe that. So, it'll by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick. And when they do, the sick will recover. And there's more uh, information about that in the book of James. We're to lay hands on the sick. We're to cast out demonic forces because we have authority over them. That's what believers do. And it says, so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. And if you read in the first chapter of Acts, you'll see that he told them to go because he was leaving, but he was sending another in his place who would not just be able to be with them physically and tangibly like Jesus had, but who would be able to be in them. And he was referring to, and that's very clearly delineated in the scriptures, this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit had not come to earth in this manifestation at that time to live inside of believers until now. And Jesus told his, you go wait until he comes, because then you're going to have the power to be my witnesses. You're going to have the power to live the life of a believer. The, the works that I do, you'll do, he said, and even greater works. Wait until the Holy Spirit comes and endues you with power. And they did, and he did. And now that he's here, we don't have to wait anymore. So the Holy Spirit is for all believers. Immediately, as soon as you receive Jesus, Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. So receive the Holy Spirit in fullness too. Didn't Jesus just say, be immersed in the Father, be immersed in the Son, and be immersed in the Holy Spirit? And that's what believers do. And then it goes on to say, and they went out, verse 20, and preached everywhere. What did they preach? They preached what Jesus told them to preach. They preached the good news. That the Savior, the Lord, has come and that he has finished his work. And the Lord working with them. So he didn't leave them to go do it on the basis of their performance. The Lord worked or partnered with them. And confirming the word. And that word means substantiating or stabilizing, bringing uh, strength to the word, so that it could be seen as so, through the accompanying signs. This is the life of a believer right here, described in Mark. And then it says, Amen. And that means, so be it. So why should we share the gospel? Because this is what Jesus said to preach. Preach my story. Preach the good news. Now later on today, and maybe several times, you're going to hear a presentation of the gospel. And that's important. Why is that important? Well, 
Let's look at Romans 10 before we go to the next. They really go together here. It's important because if people don't hear the gospel, they won't be born again. Romans 10, I'm going to read just starting in verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now there's a, a, a physical part, but even more importantly, there's a spiritual part. Believing in your heart. You can't just say words. If you don't believe them, they're just words. So we believe, and then because we believe, we acknowledge that if you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, or acknowledging with your mouth what you believe in your heart. You will anyway. Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. So if you want to know what's in someone's heart abundantly, just listen to them for a little bit and you'll find out. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then here's our responsibility. How then shall they call on him they, in whom they have not believed? Who's Jesus? You just said it this morning, Pastor. There are a lot of people who don't know who Jesus is. They won't be saved if they don't know who Jesus is. How will they call on him if they don't believe? And how will they believe in him if they've never heard of him? How are they going to hear? We're the ones who know. We'll have to do the speaking, won't we? The preaching of the gospel, the sharing of the good news. And when I say share the good news, it doesn't have to be like this. It can be you and me sitting side by side in a car somewhere or in a grocery line somewhere because the treasure's in me and the treasure's in you and somebody's hungry to know the truth. That's an opportunity of a lifetime. And it's somebody's eternal destiny right there in your realm of influence. So don't take it lightly. You have a treasure, and he needs to be shared. How will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And that doesn't mean a, you know, a formal ordained with papers preacher with a college education, even though we have a Bible college. It means somebody who will proclaim, somebody who will speak the truth in power, how then shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Well, who, are, who has those beautiful feet? We do, because the gospel's in us. So, whose responsibility is it? Isaiah said it this way, 50, Isaiah 52, 7. Proclaim salvation. Herald it abroad. Spread the seed of salvation everywhere we go. He's in us. So the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Just go back to Romans 1.16 while we're in Romans. And this is Paul writing to the Romans and he's... Let's go back to verse 14. He says, I'm a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the uh, barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. In other words, and this is where we are, Paul said, I know the gospel. I owe the gospel. So let's take that as a mission today. I know the gospel. And you will have heard it after this day. And I owe the gospel. I'm a debtor. Look what God has done for me through Jesus. I owe this because he's done it for everybody. I can't keep this for myself. I owe the gospel. So as much as is in me, Paul writes, verse 15, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. In other words, wherever I am. And then he says, why? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel 
by Jesus Christ, or the gospel of Christ. For it is the power, and that's that word dunamis or dunamis in the Greek. It's that forceful, miraculous, supernatural power of God through the Holy Spirit. The power of salvation is in the gospel. The power to do the supernatural miracle of putting the divine nature of God in a person who had the sin nature. This is how we're born again. The power of God to salvation is in the gospel. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed to tell you that. And it is for everyone who believes. That's good news. To the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Our right standing with God is revealed in the gospel because we couldn't earn it ourselves. It came to us through Jesus Christ. Jesus is your righteousness. So you don't have to worry about all the rules and getting, it, and getting everything right anymore. Righteousness lives in you and you live in righteousness. He is your righteousness. And that is how God sees it if we're in Him. And you remember Jesus prayed that we would be that one with Him. That we know that God loves us just like He loves Jesus. He sees you righteous just as He sees Jesus righteous. And it doesn't depend on you dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's and keeping all the rules. It depends on the desire of your heart now is towards your Father. And you want to please Him. And it doesn't have to be about rules anymore because it comes right out of our heart. God loves me. How much more? Because of his love in me, because it's been shed abroad in me, I can love him back. And those who've been forgiven much, love much. So we owe the gospel in love to other people. If we've been forgiven much, and we have, if we're born again, if we're in right standing with God, we've been forgiven much through Jesus. Now we owe that same love to everybody else, okay, as we have opportunity. All right. So if you were to look in, I'm going to give you some references. John 3.3 3 is the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, a religious leader. And Nicodemus is talking to him and, you know, paying him some compliments. And Jesus says, you have to be born again, John 3. You must be born again. And Nicodemus looks at this naturally and says, how can, you, how can a man return to his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus explains it to him. You don't see the wind, but you see the results of the wind. That it's a supernatural, it's a spiritual thing. Jesus explains that and he says, you are a teacher of Israel and you don't know this. And I wonder how many of us he could say that to. We're teachers, we're representatives of Jesus Christ, and we don't know the good news to give people. We must know the good news. We must be born again. Jesus explained to Nicodemus, you can't even see the kingdom of God, let alone enter it and participate in it. You can't even see the kingdom until you're born again because it's not a natural thing. It's a spiritual thing. And until you have a spiritual new birth, you can't see the kingdom. But we can because we're born again. So then he goes on to say to, to Nicodemus words that if anybody knows the scripture, they probably know this one. But let's look at it. It's in John 3.16. And it just occurred to me one day as I was reading this that he said this to, to Nick. He said this to a, a, you know, a religious leader of the Jews. And here's what he said. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm fathered by God, he told Nicodemus. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now right there is your scriptural basis for preaching the gospel and agreeing with the will of God. God isn't willing that any should perish. He doesn't want anybody to be destroyed. He's willing that all should come to the knowledge of Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, through the Gospel. That's what God is willing to do. So willing that He was He was willing to come and be born as a human being 
in the flesh and be crucified because he knew we couldn't do it. He would just come and do it for us and then let us be in him because he could finish the work. That's how much he loves us. And he doesn't want us to perish. And then he goes on to say, For God did not send his sin into the world to condemn the world. That's a message that most Christian, well, I'm going to say religious organizations, need to get in their heart. You're not here to condemn the rest of the world. So don't preach messages of condemnation and judgment because that's not good news. Jesus said preach the good news. And that is that none of us, he didn't come to condemn any of us. All right? Nobody is unqualified. Everybody is qualified if you'll just believe in him. That's good news. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, through Jesus, might be saved. If we can believe and receive, we can be. And then in John 14, I believe it's 6. I want to make sure because I don't want to tell you wrong. Jesus said, I am the way, the way, not a way, not one of the ways. I am the way. Remember that scripture in Romans? How can they, how can they hear if we don't tell them? How can they know Jesus if we don't preach Jesus? He is the way, the only way. There's no other name whereby people can be saved except in the name of Jesus. So we must preach Jesus. Is it 14.6? Yes. yes. I am the way. I am the truth. Not a truth. Not one of the truths. I am the truth. The only truth. And if we continue in that truth, His Word tells us it will make us free, liberate us. And then He says, I am the, I am the uh, way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And then he says, no one, nobody comes to the Father except through me. Through whom? Through Jesus. Why do we preach the gospel? It's the only way. Jesus is the only way people can come to the Father and be saved. That's why we preach the gospel. And that's his will, that, that men all would be saved. Okay? And then the third thing is that the gospel is good news. I take you to Luke chapter 2, which is another scripture that I'm sure that most of us are familiar with. We read it. If you don't hear it any other time, you hear it at Christmas. But I hope you read it a lot more than that. But look at Luke 2. Very familiar. You can probably quote it for me. This is where the shepherds are in the, in the, out in the fields, keeping their flock. You can probably quote it with me by night. And the angel of the Lord appears unto them and says, and you know they were afraid, he says to them, look at uh, verse 10, Luke 2, 10. Don't be afraid or fear not if you're in the King James. For behold, I bring you what kind of tidings? Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. There it is again. See, before Jesus even got to earth, this is what was proclaimed over him. Good tidings, great news, great joy, all people. And then if you'll read on and you know it says, For the, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then look at verse 14. All the heavenly hosts started praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. What? Peace. Not peace between nations. A peace that passes understanding. Jesus is peace. Peace was coming to earth from God. That's what they're announcing. And good will toward men. God loves people. We represent God through Jesus. We have to love people. And that has, that's another teaching. Okay, But Jesus demonstrated his love everywhere he went. Setting people free. Let's look at that, and that's what we're going to close with. This was the, the thing that came to me so strongly, was what was said about Jesus' birth, and then what Jesus said about himself. He'd been in the wilderness for 40 days. He'd been tempted by the enemy. 
he had come forth victorious by the word of God, and, and he was full of the Holy Spirit. And he went into his own church, we'll call it, uh, in the, the uh, synagogue, as his custom was, and was given the scriptures, and he found in the book of Isaiah this that was written. And this is in Luke, just skip, flip over a couple pages, 418. This is what Jesus said about himself. This is his mission statement. So hear him. This is what he's bringing. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has set me apart, Jesus said. But think about this. You're in Jesus. I'm in Jesus. He has set me apart to preach the gospel to the poor. What does poor mean here? It may mean without financial means. There are a lot of poor people. But it also means those who don't think they can take care of it themselves, the poor in spirit, the humble, will hear good news. They need good news. They're desperate for good news. And we have the good news. His name is Jesus. To preach the gospel to the poor. That's the first thing he said. I've been set apart to spread good news. To, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And we know he also healed the broken body. And if he ever healed, he still heals. It's the same mission statement that he, he declared here. We're taking care of spirit, soul, and body. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's Hebrews 13, 8, I believe. Check me out on that. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, freedom, pardon to the captives, the the prisoners of war, because many people are held captive. I'm not just talking, there are a lot of people in prison, yes. A lot of people in jail. But there are a lot of people who are incarcerated in their own past and their own failures and their own inability to do anything about it or their own family situations or their own economic situations or their own health situations. They're captives. And they're bound. And the good news is, Jesus has come to liberate them. But he's going to do that through us. Because we read in Mark 16 what we as believers in Jesus are supposed to do. And that is to continue his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. And do unto others as he has done for us. Amen. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And recovery of sight to the blind. And that can be physically blind, spiritually blind. They can't even see the kingdom of God until they hear the gospel and are born again. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, bruised, crushed. You know life's hard. And some people have really had some hard ships in life. But Jesus wants to set them free of all that. There's a future out there and a hope that he wants to give them. That all this can be made right in him. He's, he's, Jesus is God's offer of relationship to human beings. Come into relationship with me through my son. Because nothing's too difficult for me. That's why we preach the gospel. And... Jesus said, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And if you read, if you go back to Isaiah 61, which is what Jesus was quoting from here, he goes on to say, and to give you beauty for ashes. Um, there's several things like that that he talks about. Um, joy for mourning. And when you look at that word for, it means instead of or in lieu of. Life gives you hard. Jesus gives you help for the hard. And there's nothing that's too difficult for him. So I wanted to close today with this invitation. This is Matthew 11:28, And I do believe this is 
spoken as well as I could possibly give it. This is Jesus talking, and here's what he says. <clears throat> this is just compassion. So if I'm sniffing and my eyes are watering, don't you let that bother you. I'm not sad. This is good news, okay? It's just that it's urgent news, and people need it desperately, and we have it, and we've got to deliver it. That's why we're here. <coughs> Matthew 11, 28 says, Come to me. Who's talking here? This is in red. This is Jesus. This is the heart of the Father demonstrated through the Son and backed up by the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, come to me, all you who labor. And that doesn't mean to work hard, but it also means to feel fatigue. <coughs> you're worn out because you're trying to do it yourself in your own strength. Come to me, Jesus says. All you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden. And this heavy laden here is loaded up. Do you ever just feel loaded up like you can't go one step further or you're just so burdened that you can't carry it anymore? Well, so do a lot of other people. And Jesus said, come to me when you're like that. Interestingly, this word can also mean to be overwhelmed with ceremony or spiritual anxiety. Don't you think that's interesting? Hey, I'm telling you, religion will work you hard and hang you out to dry. And let you just suffer on your own. Because religion's never satisfied. But I'm not talking about religion today. Don't offer people religion. Jesus had a hard time with religious people. A very hard time. And his hardest sayings were for some of them. Offer a relationship. Jesus didn't say come to church. He didn't say come to a religious organization. He didn't say come to a denomination. He didn't even say come to Gospel 101. He said, come unto me. So Gospel 101 today is about Jesus, not about any of us or any message that we have. It's about the Gospel. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, loaded up for whatever reason, and I will give you rest, refreshing, reprieve from all this. Jesus said, the world, you're going to have pressure in the world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome it. And so have you and me. Take my yoke upon you. In other words, saddle up with me. You know what a yoke is that goes over two oxen, necks and backs? Jesus said, yoke up with me. Don't be yoked up with all this other stuff. It's going to wear you out and pull you down and overburden you and depress you. Yoke up with me, he says. Be my partner. Come to me. Put my yoke upon you. He won't put it on you. He says you take it. And learn from me, for I am gentle. <coughs> gentle. I love you. And lowly in heart. Humble. I didn't come to condemn anyone, and he's the only one who could. But he didn't. And he says you will find rest for your souls. Peace. Goodwill to men. That's God's message. For my yoke, Jesus says, and this is verse 30 of uh, Matthew 11, my yoke is easy, useful. That's what that means. My yoke is useful. You, you, you yoke up with me not to be oppressed. This is a good thing. You'll find my yoke useful when you partner with me. And my burden or task or service is light. It's a good thing to be born again and to have the gospel of Jesus in us and to have believed it and not just believed it but have received it and to be learning and being discipled in the truths of the kingdom of God so that we can operate in those principles. But now that we have this treasure, let us go freely give him. We have received him freely. So freely we give. That's why we are to scripturally preach the gospel, and that is in agreement with God's will. Alright? So go because you know. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. That's from Jesus. Okay? I received that for him.
Father, I thank you that you bless us indeed. You enlarge our territory. Your hands with us to keep us from evil so that we do not cause pain. And I thank you for blessing us and keeping us and for making your face to shine upon us and being gracious unto us. You lift up your countenance upon us and you give us peace. So, Lord, we gladly invite you to rise up, let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. Amen. Amen. Amen.